and welcome to Spotlights. This is the podcast for the Yale Forum on Religion and Ecology. I'm your host, Sam Mickey, and today I'm really excited to welcome onto the program Jorg Grieger. Jorg, thanks for making time for us. Great to be with you, Sam. Looking forward to it. Uh, yeah, me too, very much so. And uh, for folks who aren't familiar with your work, uh, you're a distinguished professor of theology and the Cal Turner Chancellor's Chair of Wesleyan Studies at Vanderbilt University. Uh, you're also the founding director of the Wendland Cook Program in Religion and Justice, and author and editor of, I think, about 22 books at this point. So I'm losing count and <laughs> countless articles uh, as well. And on yeah. a really wide range of topics, you know, globalization, capitalism, neoliberalism, migration, labor, uh, class, power, uh, ecology, materialism, so many things. And uh, your latest book, Theology in the Capitalocene, uh, which is a great title. And the subtitle, Ecology, Identity, Class, and Solidarity. And that's out in a really nice series from Fortress Press, uh, Dispatches, uh, which I recommend the whole series is very cool. Uh, so looking forward to chatting with you about the book. First, I always want to hear a kind of bi uh, autobiographical point. Why theology? Right, what, you know, because it's obviously not the most popular thing to study in today's universities. And when you think about issues of like politics and neoliberalism and power and privilege, people would think, well, like, good, study politics or something like that, right? Why, why theology? What led you to that? In terms of my own biography, I, I grew up uh, very religious. I, I grew up as a Methodist in Germany, of all places, uh, which is a very small church, so you have to have a very big identity. And then I came to the U.S. Uh, I'm still a Methodist, uh, but uh, I'm also realizing a lot of uh, great things and also not so great things that religion does. So um, especially in the U.S., I think religion is extremely influential and if you like it or not uh, this is something that needs to be studied uh, that's sort of one answer uh, the other answer is uh, I, I really find theology at work in in a lot of places where people would not admit that they do have a theology that was uh, something that got me into studying capitalism the economy and so on uh, realizing that there are some theologies at work that are actually hidden they're not admitted uh, but the question is, you know, are they good theologies? Are they bad theologies? And so I think that matters. I think uh, figuring out uh, what it is that people believe deep down is crucial uh, because it's not just an individual thing, but it shapes the world, it shapes politics, it shapes economics and vice versa. So the whole thing is always connected and uh, ignoring religion in this regard and theology, I think, um, we, we we lack some tools to help make a difference. Yeah, I think that's great. That's, that's really well said. And uh, a great point that's often implicit or hidden, and we don't realize how much theology is really kind of beneath the surface of everything in our world. Uh, and so then, you know, with the, the new book, you're looking at theology specifically in relationship to the Capitolocene. And so I wonder if you could just say a little bit about that, because, you know, some people not, might not be familiar with that term. Of course, it's kind of an alternative term for what people call the Anthropocene, and which might be a bit of a misnomer calling it the Anthropocene. It's like, well, we're, not all humans equally were part of this uh, like monumental transition. Uh, so what is the Capitalocene? Exactly. You've already uh, gotten us started saying this whole question. I mean, these days, everybody really uh, is talking about the Anthropocene, basically meaning we're now in a geological epoch uh, that's shaped by humanity. Before that, you know, we had the Holocene. Uh, that's about the last 11,000 years since the Ice Age, you know, flourishing of civilizations and so on. Uh, and then it goes down, uh, you know, Pleistocene and whatnot. Uh, but the question is uh, what is the geological age in which we're living. And the Anthropocene argument is to say uh, there are now, uh, what is it, seven, eight billion people on the planet, and uh, they are shaping the planet, their own future and the future of the planet in a way that's unprecedented. Uh, to some degree, that's true. But uh, you already indicated the real question is, uh, is that all that's going on? And uh, those of us who are talking about the Capitolocene are arguing uh, it's not all of humanity, billions of people, but it's really uh, some concentrated human powers that have to do uh, with capitalism uh, that are running uh, what's happening on the globe. And that's not just a matter of economics. It's really a matter of politics, 
religion, faith, culture, uh, all these things, relationships are shaped by the Capitolocene. Uh, I need to give credit to Jason Moore, a historian sociologist, who is the one who actually coined the term. And so I've been talking with Jason uh, off and on uh, ever since uh, starting this project. And uh, what's really interesting is more and more people are coming alongside and saying, well, yeah, we really have to talk about what is it that moves us. And of course, the point then is not just uh, we have this smart critique of what's going on, but this also helps us figure out what we do differently, how we how we form alternatives. Yeah, right. Yeah, I've, I've noticed even when I introduced the concept of Anthropocene to students, there'll be a couple of people who are like, uh... I don't know about that term without even priming them on that. And they're already like, I clearly isn't everybody doing this. And, and, you know, when you look at like greenhouse gas emissions and things like that, it's like, well, they're coming from wealth. It's coming from capital. And uh, the average person on the planet really isn't contributing that much. It's the small, small group, really. And so, yeah, well, big change yeah. in the way we respond to it. That, that's right. One fascinating number uh, in the book. And I mean, uh, again, this is something that the, uh, it's not my studies, but I, I referenced some studies that say that 70% of CO2 emissions globally are produced through the interests of 100 large corporations. So 70% of CO2 emissions, right, uh, the basic driver of global warming, uh, that, that's pretty serious. So um, anybody and everybody concerned about global warming and CO2 emissions should actually take a look at this and say, Whose interests are we actually servicing? That doesn't mean that uh, people's own personal lives um, couldn't also benefit from looking at some of these things. Uh, but uh, what's so interesting, uh, carbon footprint calculators, for instance, uh, well, everybody knows about these these days, right? Uh, basically tools that help us individuals figure out our own CO2 emissions, our own carbon footprint were invented uh, by British Petroleum <laughs> about 20 years ago. And, and they were the ones that then actually uh, promoted it and uh, brought it into the main line. So, so maybe they want to help us become more carbon conscious, but uh, what about them, right? Yeah. And they're like, uh, you should all look at your carbon footprint. Uh, it's, it's your problem. Each of you That's as right. individuals, don't look at yeah. us. We didn't do anything. What a coincidence. Uh, yeah, that's an alarming fact. And, and and people then feel so much personal guilt instead of realizing that, like, actually, you're trapped in the system that's kind of pushing you and pulling you. And you don't really have that, you know, it's not all uh, individual issue. It's a systemic issue. That, that's right. And religion picks that up. That's sort of the next thing. You know, this is why as a theologian, I'm so interested in this. Uh, I mean, there's now some awareness in religion that the economy and religion go together. You know, for a long time, I think we understood that politics and religion cannot be separated. But now some people are waking up and say, well, economics and religion are also connected. But then it goes, you know, once you go via carbon footprint calculators uh, without a systemic analysis, you come back to consumerism. Uh, the basic thing then is you're now blaming consumers for consuming too much. And the solution is, well, just consume less. Uh, well, that's the first step, right? Uh, not, not a bad idea in general but what that approach forgets is the fact that the consumers are actually um, not out there by themselves either and that consumption is enticed in so many ways in our culture right i mean there's a whole industry that's geared towards enticing consumption uh relationships are geared to enticing consumption religion again plays a role again and so uh if we're not asking what's at the core of consumerism and that points us back to capitalism and the capital zine, if we're not asking that i think we're not really uh moving towards the solution right well, and a big part of you know what you're doing is is really rethinking agency. You know who who has capabilities for acting right now, and uh, it's you know when you think, well, we're not just individuals. We're part of this consumer system. We're part of capitalism, and the capital scene is also making us rethink the agency of non-humans. You know what are carbon dioxide molecules doing? What is the agency of the planet? So to me, one of the really exciting things here. Uh, is that you're really opening up this new understanding of agency across people and the planet. So I wonder if you could speak to a little bit about uh, how that figures into your thinking. That's probably the core question of the book. So I'm, I'm really glad you picked that up, this whole question of agency, right? Uh, who is doing what, you know? Uh, and we've already talked about uh, who is doing part of the damage. 
But if you think about uh, who is part of the solution, you really have to think more broadly too. So at that level, of course, uh, I'm very interested in alternative human agency. What is it that people can do? Uh, and this is why, uh, you know, in my own work and at the Wendling Cook Program in Religion and Justice at Vanderbilt, we're working on worker cooperatives, labor, and all these questions. But that's connected, uh, as you just suggested, uh, with other than human labor too, right? I mean, so it's not just humans uh, pushing things, but it's really much broader questions of, uh, you know, what other agencies are there? And then for me, the big question, this is sort of the end of the subtitle of the book, is always solidarity. How can we work together? How can we develop some synchronicity uh, among people, among people in the planet, among human and non-human other than human um agents uh and and uh you know i, I let, let me give you a few examples because i think this is really important it, it might sound a little esoteric and abstract at first uh but uh yeah i mean uh the whole planet in some ways uh has agency and, and of course uh in the current capitalistic mindset, uh, that's considered externalities, right? Whatever the planet does, uh, we we can appropriate for our own uh, for our own benefit. I mean, our own uh, really. Uh, the big businesses do that. The corporations do that. Um, labor is treated the same way. You know, uh, we have to keep labor costs low in order to make profits bigger. Uh, so, labor and uh, human and non-human, uh, productive and reproductive labor, is um, on the back of which this is all built. And so if you think about that uh, and you turn it around, you can say, well, that's where the solutions should come from. Because, uh, you know, no boss, no corporation could ever say only a debt worker is a good worker or only a debt planet is a good planet, right? They need this. Uh, this is this is essential. Uh, now we're talking about essential workers, of course, in, uh, after COVID uh, or at the tail end of COVID. Uh, and so all of that together is really uh, now uh, where I think the solutions are coming from. I'll, I'll give you one uh, really cool example of non-human agency. Uh, this is something I came across recently after finishing the book. Um, in in uh, the West, in the US, uh, they're now reintroducing beaver populations. Mm -hmm. um, and what these beavers are doing, what beavers have always done, right, is they're building dams. Uh, they're helping, uh, you know, the whole flow of water, the whole water cycle and so on. Uh, and uh, there's already studies that show how these beavers building dams in places that really need water and that need to preserve water and, uh, you know, be worried about the flow and the whole circulation of water. Um, that's already doing some, uh, bringing some real benefits to the environment. Uh, and uh, I think gradually we're realizing how even uh, that small activity has an impact on global warming. So so, so it's actually all related and you can say, well, beavers in the American West might not save us. Uh, but on the other hand, you know, think about humans uh, and beavers working together. And then of course, beavers and uh, all kinds of other species all the way to, you know, um, the sort of, non-human life that we never really think about, uh, you know, like bacteria and right. uh, molecules. I mean, you mentioned earlier, right, um, that we e even think about the interplay of molecules here. Uh, that's pretty cool stuff. And that needs a lot more work because I'm only hinting at it in the book. Yeah, right. Uh, we're still so uh, anthropocentric in so much of our thinking. And, and so the, the Anthropocene, the Capitalocene is helping to kind of crack that open. And we're like, oh, right, there's more than just humans around. And what if we can kind of partner with some of the more than human world? And yeah, beavers are a great example because it's also adorable. And so yeah. I like the idea that maybe the solutions to our problems can also be fun and cute and it's not yeah. always just oh this is going to be really difficult work and how are we possibly going to do this and something like beavers it's like no we can we just you know look at the world around us and find new relationships with them and so in that sense solidarity includes solidarity with the other creatures we're inhabiting the planet with let me say a word about solidarity here because uh, you're pushing it in exactly the way i want it to go mm -hmm. namely uh, solidarity is fun uh, I mean, there's sort of a, a, you know, politically correct type of solidarity where constantly you're moralizing constantly, you know, you're blaming people, making people feel guilty and bad and whatnot. Uh, well, what if solidarity were not that, uh, but really sort of um, a happy 
confluence of agency, right? Where you put uh, various agents together. Um, now, I'm I'm not naive about this. Uh, this this brings along tensions, conflicts. Relationships are always complex and complicated. Uh, but the basic motivation here is not some sour, you know, uh, we have to save the world. But uh, what if we simply let things happen? What if we paid more attention to the agency that's already out there? I think this is something that social activism oftentimes misses, paying attention to the energy, the agency uh, that's already flowing, uh, rather than thinking we have to do it all ourselves. Yeah, right. Like, all right, we're going to have to build something up out of nothing. And how are we going to do that? And like, no, there's, there's already a lot happening. Yeah, uh, especially yeah, the energies of the planet and uh, and social activities that are already happening. And yeah, I like that. It feels so much uh, more like a, a celebration in that sense. And I think that's probably one of the areas where theology can really help and be like, no, this is there's you know movements of, of grace and uh, and joy, and it's uh, there's a sort of pleasure to to this kind of activism. You could say this is, you know, where we can talk about God again. Now, as a theologian, I'm always trying to figure out ways to talk about God. And usually I, I get there by figuring out ways of talking about God that are detrimental and damaging. Uh, we, we have to be really honest about that. But then once you've cut through all of that, you can say, well, here's some real alternatives and here's new ways of thinking about God. And, you know, um, I'm a Christian theologian, so I'll talk about the Christian God here. I uh, could even talk about the Trinity, if that helps. But, uh, you know, for those who are not Christian theologians, they could talk about all kinds of other things that are moving, right? So, uh, in this sense, you know, I think we have some interreligious excitement here, too, where people could talk about different ways of their experiences of the divine or different ways of uh, their experiences of they might not even want to call it divine uh, something that's bigger than us something that moves and uh, that uh, we simply miss because we're not paying attention yeah i think that's so important and uh, cuz i mean if we're trying to really build you know a global movement it's got to be something where we can reach out to other traditions and other faith communities including people who don't subscribe to any particular faith uh, well, you know, along those lines, I'm curious, you know, when once you start talking about uh, the planet and really respecting other creatures and things like that, then people say, well, maybe now uh, you've, you've collapsed God into nature. And there's all these debates about the relationship between transcendence and immanence. And uh, I think maybe that's also where we get some of the, the bad ideas about God might be in the ways people negotiate transcendence and immanence. Uh, so I know that's a big part of the book. I'm curious, how are you handling these big old theological categories, transcendence and eminence in relationship to the capitalism, in relationship to theology. Yeah, there, there's some surprises in the book because normally, you know, I mean, let's talk transcendence and eminence here for a moment. Uh, normally, that's sort of a conservative liberal conversation where, you know, typically conservative theology is more interested in transcendence. Liberals say, well, we have to be all about eminence. Uh, and then, of course, uh, I'm also in... The imminence camp, uh, but I want to preserve transcendence. And so so the interesting question is, how do you do that? Um, I think one of the mistakes imminent camp is to assume that anything, everything material, anything that's imminent uh, is already great and God and wonderful, and we don't uh, really have to raise any questions. Uh, my argument is different. I'm saying uh, there are different kinds of imminences. So the capitalocene as such is a tremendous imminence um, that's actually detrimental. Uh, that's actually hurting uh, not only people, but the planet. Uh, and it's doing damage uh, in an unprecedented way so that we don't even know what's going to happen. We don't even know if, uh, you know, humanity as such or civilization is going to survive. Uh, I mean, the planet in some ways will be okay, but uh, maybe we won't. So, so that sort of imminence, uh, one has to be really clear and say, uh, no, uh, that's not the way things ought to be working. That's not the way uh, imminence really makes sense. And so um, the challenge then is, you know, how do you actually build an alternative imminence? And so my argument is to say, well, uh, once you've figured out uh, where the problems are, you start looking where some of the alternatives are coming from. So 
if the basic principle of the capital of scene is exploitation and extraction, which it is, right? This is basically exploitation of human labor is still how the economy runs, even in the age of finance capitalism and extraction of natural resources is how it gets fueled. Uh, if that's the basic principle, uh, you ask, uh, well, is there non-extractive, uh, non-exploitative imminences? Uh, and actually, we find that. I mean, I find that, for instance, uh, in worker cooperatives, this is something that we're very interested at the Wendling Cook program. By the way, if anybody wants to look up uh, the program, it's just one word. Type that uh, in religionandjustice.org. Um, religionandjustice, one word, dot org is the Wendling Cook program. So so for us, here are, are some of the real alternatives in, in when it comes to imminence. Um, so in other words, uh, you have to point out uh, where do you find God, but you also have to draw the line and say, I don't think this is God. I don't think this sort of imminence, you know, um, some some big compound uh, that basically produces wealth for the few uh, and poverty uh, for the many and pollutes the planet. Uh, this is not the right kind of imminence. So 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 there has to be a line. And the same is true for transcendence. So So figuring out that uh, some sort of transcendences are damaging, I think is really crucial. And a lot of progressive liberal theologians would agree there. Uh, but then the question is, where's, where's the transcendence that's actually helpful? Okay. Um, you know, there's sort of, an, for those, the theology nerds here, uh, there's an old model, uh, I think Karl Barth said it the best, and I'm not a Barthian, but uh, let's give Barth here a, a chance, uh, where he talks about, uh, in, in a little book, Dogmatics and Outline, he talks about God in the highest, and he basically says God in the highest is the Christ child in the manger. So, so transcendence here is not ethereal, uh, out of this world, uh, non-material, but transcendence is simply a way of transcending dominant imminence. That's how I think it makes a lot of sense. So when we talk about imminence, the question is not, are we pro or con imminence, but which imminence are we talking about? And where is that transcending immin imminence that actually transcends the dominant status quo? So in the capital of scene, the interesting thing is there's always resistance. Uh, and uh, that's where I think the God talk thing could be helpful. Mm -hmm. Namely, um, not saying, well, is God everywhere, pantheism, panentheism, and all that stuff? Well, so what? Uh, the question is more specific. Uh, where exactly is God at work? And where is God not at work? You know, uh, I don't want to come in uh, with big metaphysical claims about the devil, uh, but I think we should talk about evil. We should talk about sin uh, and figure out what are these things that are not helpful? What are these things that are actually detrimental? Oh, that's a great way to think about it. I like that a lot. Yes, yeah, there is something, you know, I enjoy good discussions of pantheism, panentheism and things like that, but it it is it gets it gets so big that it misses some of these specifics, of, you know, the Christ child in the manger and things like that. So, yeah, See, that's a the, great the way to think about it. The the problem with it uh, I think is it's it's a, it's almost like the culture wars. It's a liberal conservative ping pong game. Mm -hmm. You say transcendence, I say imminence. Mm -hmm. I say imminence, you say transcendence. That's sort of a game, you know. I say pantheism, you say no. I say uh, no, you say panentheism. You know what whatever you want to do. Uh, that's a ping pong game, you know. That that's to some degree fairly irrelevant actually because it's simply uh, I'm right or you're wrong or you're right and I'm wrong. Mm -hmm. Whatever is going on here. Uh, we're not asking the more interesting questions, namely, um, not only where is God, but uh, where do we belong? What's what's our place here? Uh, and to think about our place as just squarely in nature, I think is not is not good enough. You know, to think about you know I am just walking through the forest on a sunny day. Uh, well, that's fun. I I like doing that, but that's not good enough. You know, you th need to think about where are the beavers? Uh, where do you need to be uh, with the beavers, right? You need to talk about uh, where um, are some really harmful things going on? Uh, yeah. Where do we have to draw a line? Where we have, where do we have to say no? And and that's the interesting question here. And, and then I think uh, pantheism and panentheism could become interesting again. Yeah. Yeah, in that context, they could really contribute. And, you know, I got to ask you about new materialism as well, because it's such an interesting um, philosophical movement that's emerged in the last oh, 20 years and uh, really gained a lot of attention more recently. And it seems like this is similar to the you know pantheism issues, thinking, you know, imminence, seeing the human as part of this larger 
material relationship with non-humans and that kind of stuff. Um, but similarly, as, uh, as some of these debates with pantheism and panentheism, uh, you, you draw on new materialism, but you also hold it accountable for sometimes missing the specifics of, you know, social movements and things like that. So I'm curious, how, how is new materialism showing up in this, uh, this new book? Yeah, this is a great question. Uh, it's, it's really, I mean, in some ways, it's really crucial. Uh, you know, somebody who reads the book will find it in chapter two, uh, where I deal uh, with these very questions of not just materialism, but specific forms of materialism that actually matter, because it's the same thing again, right? Uh, simply saying matter matters. Well, that's great. Uh, but the more interesting question is how and where and where is the movement happening? Um, now, what new materialism has done well, I must uh, start there, is is really sort of helped us become aware of uh, all kinds of material processes around us that are maybe other than human, bigger than us, uh, that can uh, you know very uh, can help us to see interesting things going on in the world and maybe even put up some resistance and alternatives to the capitalist scene, um, but. The question to me is always, you know, uh, where, where is um, the movement happening? Where is it going? And so, uh, yeah, my own take on new materialism really holds uh, the new materialism accountable for not being as clear enough about social movements. And that's, of course, the human part, right? So if you think about human agency, I mean, what is more human uh, material agency than labor? Uh Right, uh, productive labor and reproductive labor. Uh, actually, in the book, a uh, quick footnote here: I'm using Paul Tillich's notion of the ultimate concern, where he says mm -hmm. only your uh, life and death matters are ultimate concern. I'm saying, well, take that to productive and reproductive labor, because without the reproductive labor of your mother, the gestational labor of your mother, you wouldn't be even here, right? Uh, of course, uh, reproductive labor, uh, that's nature, non-human, uh, that is also minority labor for the most part, which is foundational for everything else, but is not recognized. So, so that's your solid foundation of anything uh, materialism related. Uh, unfortunately, I don't see the new materialism talking about labor much. Mm. Uh, by the way, uh, there's not much talk about labor in theology anyways, uh, which I have argued backwards and forwards for 20 years. Um, so far, uh, not many people have been willing to listen, even though I think we're, we're we're moving uh, here a bit. Uh, there's more resonance internationally, I think, at this point uh, than in the United States. So, so that's all part of the new materialism, where I think uh, if we broaden the conversation, um, I mean, including energy, which is really crucial, right? Talking about energy is a huge part of new materialism. But to think about that in relation to human energy, and um, then, of course, also where's the energy going? that's taking us in the right direction. And there's a lot of energy taking us in the wrong direction. So, so those distinctions also have to be made. Uh, not necessarily people now get worried, oh, well, this is all normative stuff. Well, of course, it's normative to some degree, uh, but it's a matter of survival. So it's not, uh, you know, I want to develop big norms, uh, but I want to live and I want to flourish and I want other people to live and to flourish too. So, so those are some of the fundamental issues uh and probably when we're talking about materialism um this is a typical sort of american way of looking at it. i i also need to add one caveat uh, and this is a typical understanding of materialism in common usage uh, it's this idea that matter is everything and so you know then people have this critique you shouldn't be so materialistic you shouldn't worry so much about stuff well that's sort of a, a deflated version of materialism that's not what we're talking about that just uh, well, whatever it is, uh, I'm not interested in it. E even that materialism is never materialism either. If you're worried about stuff, you know, like a new cell phone and so on, it's not about the cell phone, but it's about being connected, being heard, being loved, you know, being <laughs> in relationships, whatnot, having uh, ways uh, to control the world or whatever. Uh, that's materialism uh, always uh, is never just flat. Uh, the other one is sort of, uh, you know, then uh, neuroscience, perhaps, you know, looking at the brain and saying, you know, uh, emotions, uh, faith, love, all of that are just chemical reactions in the brain or whatever uh that's sort of a uh, materialism that's also pretty flat uh and and not that interesting so new materialism is not that 
that's that's very important for everybody to realize uh, it's always a dialectical relationship between matter and spirit put it this way uh, but that's of course part of the historical uh, materialism uh, dialectical materialism that a lot of people are not aware of uh, where say with Marx uh, and some of the materialists you know 150 years ago uh, around that time there's a real dialectical relationship the question is not uh, just matter 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 but how do matter and spirit relate together and that's my main interest here how do we reshape spirituality in relation to taking material reality seriously and and that's i think uh something that again the new materialism does well and helps us uh, think in that direction yeah i think that's that's all really helpful because i've had that even if i mentioned some stuff about new materialism to somebody and they're like oh so then there's no spirituality I'm like no no it's not it's not that at all and i get the just the word materialism can be a little confusing and uh it's like no of course not and uh and really when you think of you know this the importance of like marx's critique of capitalism like no we we need some of that like desperately and so i like that you know you're able to draw on new materialism and theology and really put them together in the service of, of building these kinds of new forms of solidarity uh, I think that's such important work because uh, new materialism doesn't seem like it's doing it on its own. It needs theology to come in and say, okay, there's other issues to think about. And then let's pay attention more to social movements and really get it going. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, some new materialism is just really good descriptions of buildings and things like that. And like, that's great, but we need to, we need to push it. And yeah, I, I especially appreciate the point that like, if I sound normative, it's just that I want people to survive. <laughs> and so I'm not trying to, you know, uh, imprison people in my, in my norms. We're just trying to figure out ways to, to flourish together. And, you know, I wonder, you know, I noticed uh, you described uh, this kind of deep solidarity that's impossible, but also possible. So I wonder, you know, what's going on? Anytime somebody puts the M uh, in parentheses, it's possible and impossible. I'm always so curious about that sounds kind of like a deconstructive possibility or something uh but it seems like you don't mean that in a disempowering way uh so what's what's the impossibility of solidarity so that that is to me really the big question as i said a moment ago you know if you think about solidarity here between humanity and the planet uh, and and the goal is flourishing of life so it's not some goal of you know turning you into my image or making you do something that i want you to do but just you know how, what's the best way for all of us to flourish uh and and then of course the other piece you know uh this is something that our language uh, we often use covers up so we talk about the oppressed minorities the exploited and so on and the idea is oh there are some people you know minimum wage workers or the unemployed or somebody you know uh, minority workers who are especially suffering uh and they really are especially suffering. But the truth is uh, the majority here is exploited. The majority here is not benefiting from the system. That was the wisdom of Occupy Wall Street's notion of the 99%. We, we are the 99%. And uh, even though uh, that may be a bit esoteric too, uh, there's clear studies that say two thirds of Americans are working class to begin with. Um, and most of non-human nature is all working class because it's harnessed by uh, this capitalist scene for for the benefit of the few uh, against the many. Uh, so, so if you put that together, uh, you already have some built-in notion of what solidarity might be like, uh, namely not uh, this or that group that you put yourself in solidarity with, but those of us, uh, the many of us who are actually not benefiting by the system uh, from the system. So, so the basic foundation of solidarity here is not a moral imperative. You should be in solidarity, but just think about who you are naturally in solidarity with. Um, Paul, the apostle put it in first Corinthians 12 saying, if one member suffers, all suffer together with it. Uh, well, if the planet is suffering uh well guess what humanity is suffering with it we're seeing that now pretty clearly uh if the least of these are suffering uh the 99 are suffering too and maybe the one percent 
as well. Uh, but then they have a lot of stuff that the rest of us don't have, you know, private islands and, you know, all kinds of things, uh, private jets uh, and boats and, uh, you know, uh, guards and uh, private protection. And uh, of course, always uh, their foot in the door of politics, uh, no matter what politician you're talking about, right? So so uh, those things, uh, there's sort of uh, some flows that we have to pay attention to. So solidarity the simple reminder is a lot deeper than we're usually thinking it does. So, so social movements becoming aware uh, that they're also in uh, relation with other social movements. So there are different social causes, obviously. Uh, and then, of course, uh, the bigger uh, movement of the planet here also as, as something that's in solidarity. So that's the solidarity I'm talking about, uh, which then is something that has diversity built in from the get-go. So it's solidarity is not, we should all be alike now, but exactly the opposite. We should realize uh, what we have in common, namely being exploited and extracted uh, from uh and then to say, well, uh, what would our different uh, things that we bring to it actually contribute? So non-human nature is contributing something. Of course, not just beavers and dames, uh, but also hurricanes and tornadoes, you know, right. tearing down some of that which was uh, illicitly built. Um, but uh, you have that. Uh, and, and then you have sort of a whole new way of, of thinking about how we're in this together. By the way, this is part of interreligious dialogue too. Yeah. The point here is not how are the religious the same or what what do we have in common, but what do each of our religions contribute to the solution? That's the interesting question. Uh, and uh, in that sense, solidarity here is open-ended. Unity and diversity perhaps is sort of a, an easy way of putting it. Uh, I need to point out, though, uh, what is the opposite of this kind of solidarity, mm -hmm. because there is a right wing solidarity uh, that I think is really concerning. Uh, this is the solidarity where everything is supposedly uh, looking alike or supposed to be looking made to look alike. On the one hand, uh, it is, uh, you know, marching in lockstep, wearing uniforms, you know, shouting uh, ideological phrases and whatnot um, in order to cover up the other solidarity that we're talking about. So nationalism, for instance, uh, is is a great way, uh, right wing way of being solid in solidarity because it suggests to anybody in a nation that you have more in common uh, with the bosses and the people that run your country than with the rest of humanity and the world. Um, racism is a great example too. You know, white supremacy is a way of convincing white Americans, especially, that they have more in common with the white ruling class uh, than with black working people and immigrants and the rest of nature. Um, so, so this is the faulty solidarity here, uh, where uh, you know there's no way forward with homogeneity, homogeneity, sameness, and so on. Yeah, that's helpful. I like the discerning the the good solidarity from harmful solidarity, just in the same way of, you know, it's not transcendence or imminence, which transcendence, which imminence. And uh, yeah, because it seems like uh, some of those harmful solidarities are very intoxicating and people fall for it very easily. So important to to criticize those forms and, and realize that there's already this bigger solidarity that we're part of, even without trying. We already have solidarity with even I think of the human microbiome, right? I have solidarity with all of these bacterial and fungal cells that are already in my body. And so you can realize, oh, it's already happening. There's this bigger solidarity that we can participate in. So so in a way, it's not an imperative, but it's it's simply a recognition of what's already there. And, and I think this is where the new materialism is helpful because it helps us see this connectedness that we're oftentimes overlooking. You know, we get so cerebral or focused on certain things, certain actions that we don't see this this broader connection. But once you see it, uh, then I think there is a political project and an economic project that comes out of it, uh, namely that you now use your agency not for the dominant system, but for building alternative relationships. So, so that really turns things around 180 degrees. Um, maybe a quick example of how religion functions here too, because this this is, I think, uh, the big confusion these days, where people think, uh, well, in the religious dialogue, I mentioned that a minute ago, you know, we, we should all just love everybody and not ask any questions. Uh, that doesn't make any sense. I mean, we want to know what are the various religions contributing to the common good, right? How are they in solidarity and so on? But once you've said that, uh, you now need to figure out 
how is religion part of the problem? And here my suggestion is you start at home. So for me as a Christian theologian, the question is not first of all, how is Buddhism a problem or Hinduism, but how is Christianity a problem? And in the process, I might realize it's like transcendence and immanence again, what the conversation we just had, that maybe uh, if I realize that within Christianity, there's large parts of it uh, who are so uh, enamored with the capitalism or so shaped by the capitalism uh, that I really need to draw a line and say, this is not Christianity. Now, that sounds utterly judgmental, and we shouldn't be so judgmental. Uh, but think about my own German background here in the Holocaust. Uh, that was absolutely necessary uh, to draw a line and to say this is fascist Christianity and this is non-fascist Christianity because fascist Christianity kills. So so figuring out uh, in terms of your own religions uh, and maybe not being shy, pointing out that in other religions you have similar dynamics. I mean, the Christian who is disillusioned with Christianity and thinks Buddhism is the solution. Uh, well, you haven't studied Buddhism. You don't know what's going on. Um, you just have an idea uh, of something. Uh, so the point about interreligious solidarity then is as we work together, we also realize uh, where we need to draw the lines. And so it's quite possible that I may have more in common with a Buddhist who is working for the flourishing of humanity and the planet, uh, then with a Christian who is sort of uh, part of the old capitalist scene, uh, trying to exploit and extract as much as they can. Yeah, no, that's a great point. Yeah, I think of like the friendship of uh, Martin Luther King and, and Thich Nhat Hanh. And it's like, well, we're both working toward peace. So even though you're Christian, you're a Zen Buddhist, it's like, yeah, but we're working toward that form of solidarity. And, uh, and you know, some of this also reminds me, I just have to say, you have this wonderful book with Kwok Puilan, Occupy Religion. And uh, I think that also gets into some of this uh, discussion of like, well, what can religion contribute toward building new forms of solidarity, the 99%. Uh, so just have to mention that it's a fantastic book. I've used it in classes. Uh, so oh, uh, thanks. I appreciate that. Yeah, that that one was written fairly quickly. Puilan and I uh, sort of got together <laughs> at the AR when it all broke loose. You know, I said we, we need something, uh, and uh, then uh, the subtitle of that theology of the multitude uh, really is another way of talking about that solidarity that we just addressed. Yeah, yeah, I think that's so important, and certainly, you know, for the forum on religion and ecology, that's a big part of uh, you know what we do is try to think of this as an interreligious project and. It, can't just be religions in their own silos doing their own thing. Um, so I don't know, geez, I could, I could talk to you forever about these things. Um, but one, I really want to hear about reparations. I haven't gotten to this part of, of the book yet, right? Theology in the capital of scene. What is theology going to contribute to reparation reparations for who and how is this going to happen? It's such an exciting topic. And I think one that maybe some people just write off and they're like, Oh, that's, that's just impossible. That's never going to happen. Uh, so, how's reparations fitting into uh, to what you're thinking? That that is, uh, you know, I mean, uh, in in the book, it's the conclusion. So, so the conclusions are specifically on reparations for um, African American enslavement. That's that's the focus. Uh, and and I'm not saying that's the only reparations that matter, but uh, it's a way. Um, so uh, the structure of the book has four chapters. The first two are on ecology. Uh, the third one is on the class issue, which I think is still completely um, neglected in certainly in theological studies. The fourth is on intersectionality. So this is where race, class, gender, and ecology come together. And then finally, the conclusion is, well, what would this mean for reparations? And so I look at very specifically the example of uh, African-American enslavement in the United States. Uh, and I'm taking this back to this, I mean, the broader question of the capitalist scene, of course, is always uh, who exploits who, right? So so capitalist scene is not just, well, this is the age of capital, but it is an age of tremendous exploitation and extraction, and uh, that shapes everything. So if you think about uh, enslavement, uh, especially chattel uh, slavery, that uh, the form that we've developed here in the United States, uh, this is sort of the ultimate form of exploitation of everything, right? So it's the exploitation of the labor power of these enslaved Africans. 
but it's really all of life. I mean, uh, culture, the way they think, the mind, uh, religion is always part of it. And so uh, once you realize uh, what's wrong, and of course you could develop the same argument then for reparations for uh, indigenous communities, for uh, you know uh, environmental damage and so on, what is exploited and how do we actually address that? Uh, then uh, again, it's a materialist argument where you say, uh, saying you're sorry is not enough. Simply developing a new spirituality is not enough, uh, even though that's part of it, right? Repentance, all uh, the old theological categories can, can be brought back fruitfully. Sin and evil, grace, uh, those salvation, you name it, uh, th those are all part of it. But very materially uh, asking, how do we change things? And so my basic suggestion then uh, for this particular case is to say, what if we went back and changed something about the labor relationships? In other words, uh, made labor not just less exploitive, but maybe stop exploiting altogether. Uh, that happens again through uh, this worker cooperative work that I mentioned earlier. Uh, but there's great traditions in the African-American um, history of African-American communities supporting each other, you know, from uh, maroon societies uh, to mutual aid societies, but again, also uh, worker and labor co-ops uh, that you find in, in the black traditions. Uh, the reasons why a lot of these are not around anymore is not because they fell apart, because they were so successful that the dominant system came after them and destroyed them. Uh, so that's a little reminder that whatever you do in resisting, you always have to be networked, because if you're not, if you start a worker co-op somewhere uh, in the woods of Tennessee, uh, they'll come and find you and shut you down. Uh, so you need you need bigger connections. Uh, but but once you go there and once you think about how do we repair these fundamental problems, what's broken, uh, you could actually see how this help this would help African American minority communities today a lot more uh, than either just feeling bad all the time or uh, protesting all the time. Uh, you're now building economic power from the bottom up, which translates into communal power, which translates into cultural power, which translates into religious power. Uh, and it spreads beyond the community. I mean, this spreads now from African-American communities to could spread, is spreading to immigrant communities back into the white working class community as well. So, so you're building this uh, with some real benefits for the natural environment because worker co-ops by design are less exploitative because um, not only are people people treated fairly, uh, people now have some agency uh, and they wouldn't, they're less likely to mess up their, their environment where they live, you know, where the communities thrive, where their kids are breathing the air and whatnot and playing in the dirt. Uh, so all these things are now put together and uh, what you get is is sort of a, a movement from the bottom up that is very material, builds on labor and reproductive labor relationships, uh, but it has the potential to transform spirituality. It has the potential to produce new theology. That's where I do my theology. That's where I learn my lessons. Uh, and it has the potential really um, then uh, hopefully down the road uh, after a while uh, to lead into something after the capital is seen. Yeah, that's, that's really hopeful. I really just, you know, and so simple in a way, you know, it's one of those things like, yeah, just cooperate co-ops. It's, it's that easy. Just network with people and places around you. And uh, one of the things I always appreciate about your work is it always is down to earth. And, you know, it's like, let's look at what people are really doing. And I want to hear a little bit more about what you're doing at Vanderbilt. What is this worker co-op stuff that you're up to? It sounds so exciting. You know, and uh, you really put it so well now. Uh, it, it sounds simple. And in a way, it is simple. I mean, it's deceptively simple because you think, well, uh, if the basic problem of the capital is seen is let's call it exploitation. I mean, extraction goes along with it. If it is exploitation, building your fortune on the back of other people and non-people, non-human, you know, human and non-human. Uh, if that's what the problem is, what do you do? You know, uh, then you figure out who is being exploited uh, and how does that produce solidarity? Uh, very simple. You know, you don't need a lot of huge metaphysics uh, and uh, you don't even have to read Marx. I mean, uh, the fact that workers are essential and that there is class struggle, um, I mean, any grocery worker could tell you that. Uh, Warren Buffett said it, uh, 
I think 2006, there is class struggle in my class is winning it. Uh, well, you do not have to read Karl Marx to see these things. And so by addressing that, I think, uh, you know, uh, we could say, well, now I, I, I tell you the theoretical solution, but we're actually experimenting with, with doing these things differently. So at the Wendling Cook program, then at Vanderbilt, this is, this is the project uh, that we're running, uh, where we're trying to bring faith and solidarity economy together. And we want to see how that reshapes each other, sort of, it goes in both directions. So hopefully faith is not just a problem, it can also have some ideas and solutions that are healthy and life-giving. Uh, versa really need the help from some real uh, deep relationships that go back to the ultimate concern of productive and reproductive labor. So one thing that we're running now, and this might be interesting for, for some people listening, is uh, we call it solidarity circles. Uh, we, we're just running the second cohort. We have about 30, 40 individual faith communities. Uh, each of these communities uh, is, uh, you know, experimenting um, with relationships to a solidarity economy. Uh, the one thing we always suggest for me, I think this is the crucial one, is, is cooperatives, worker co-ops specifically. And so as this is happening, you know, as uh, communities are moving their way into that, uh, we're seeing some transformation. I mean, uh, I'm a theologian, so I'm interested in theological transformation. How is this changing your images of God? You know, how is this changing your images of uh, of anything, you know, in, in theology, salvation, sin and evil, you name it. Um, but um, it's also very practical. You know, how is this changing your personal relationships? How is this changing your community? And one of the arguments uh, we're making here is that, you uh, we need to talk more about economic democracy. Uh, this is something that nobody's, I mean, not nobody, that's that's wrong. I mean, there's people talking about it, but uh, in theological fields, in the faith-based world, that's not a conversation as far as I know. Um, people are worried about political democracy for good reasons. Uh, it's in jeopardy. Uh, but we're saying, what if political democracy could actually be strengthened through economic democracy? What if, uh, say, uh, these communities actually um, not only had a vote, but some real power that goes with the vote? You know, if you have some economic power, you may be heard more in the political realm than if you don't, right? Um, and of course, then uh, how is this going hand in hand with economic, uh, sorry, uh, religious democracy, right? Economic, political, and religious democracy. In other words, how are these relationships and worker cooperatives uh, working uh, out themselves in, in faith communities? And uh, here we are, I mean, these solidarity circles, we're working closely with an entity here in Nashville. Um, the Southeast Center for Cooperative Development. Uh, we've done some work, uh, done some faith and co-op work. Uh, that's on their website. If you check out the Southeast Center, their website is co-opsnow, co-opsnow.org. And uh, in, in, in some of these collaborations, I mean, some of that is local and some of it then is really uh, through national and international networks. Um, you know, happy news here. Even the World Council of Churches is, is catching on. We're going to do some work with them in August. Um, and, and some of the other uh, international global religious bodies seem to be catching on before some of our uh, American big denominations are catching on. I'm still talking to my fellow Methodists, but uh, that might be a while. That, yeah, that's exciting. It's really, I don't know, uh, you know, a book called Theology in the Capitalocene, you think, oh, okay, here comes the bad news. <laughs> and then it turns out there is still a lot of good news and uh, a lot of hope and courage. And, you know, it's uh, exciting. And it really it makes me want to go, uh, you know, hang out with you in Vanderbilt. But it also would be nice to see more universities doing this kind of work and universities could be hubs for this kind of activity. And so, yeah, it's just it's just such exciting work. I mean, let, let's figure it out. I mean, it would be great to have you here for a bit, you know, and maybe have some of these conversations here and uh, pick your brain. I mean, we've mostly talked about what I'm doing. I mean, I, I know you're doing important work and then, uh, you know, there are many other people around the country and the world. But I, I must say that the Wendland Cook Program in Religion and Justice, so economic, ecological justice is what we're committed to. Um, as far as I know, it's the only program, not only in the country, but in the world, uh, that puts these things together with labor and cooperative work. That's, that's the crazy thing. I mean, you think, well, theology and economics is now a field that 
more and more people are studying, uh, but no one uh, is talking about labor, not 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 in in the professional academy. I mean, of course, there's people on the ground. Uh, there's religion and labor movements emerging. Some of them have died. Some of them are emerging. Uh, that's all great. Uh, but this is not uh, a conversation. Uh, of course, uh, the point here is not to say this needs to displace all other conversations, but why are we not joining forces? You know, why are we not putting this together with critical race theory, uh, with uh, questions of sexuality and gender? Uh, why are we not digging deeper with the ecology piece here? You know, uh, once we've said we need to pay attention to ecology, uh, that's a great start, but how do we do it? And then have conversations about what each of us could contri could contribute to it. Yeah, that's a great way to, to think about it. Yeah, we're not trying to dominate uh, all those conversations as much as connect them. Like, hey, look, we're, we're actually on the same team here and we're a lot stronger together. Exactly, yeah. Great, well, I cannot imagine a better note to end on uh, that's uh, really hopeful and uh, positive. And I hope people uh, listening to this read the book, but also engage with some of these uh, movements the way you're talking about and find that deep solidarity within. Uh, so thanks so much, Jörg Rieger. Uh, really a pleasure to talk with you. And same here, Sam. I really enjoyed the conversation. Thanks for, for great questions. Uh, we could have gone on. We were saying in the beginning that could be a three-hour uh, yeah. podcast, but uh, <laughs> we're not going to put our, our listeners through it. Uh, but uh, it would be fun. Maybe we continue at some point. Thanks. Oh, yeah, definitely. And uh, yeah, have to have you uh, back on again soon. I'm sure there will be another book in the works in, uh, in not too long. Uh, so yeah, I'm, lo I'm looking forward to chatting again uh, in the future. Very good. Uh, thanks. So yeah, thanks so much. And thanks for everybody uh, for tuning in. We'll be back uh, with some more conversations for you soon. In the meantime, take care and be well. <laughs>